morning, everyone. Stand uh, as we this morning. Stand with us, I guess, we're up here standing. But uh, we'll open with a word of prayer. It's so good to see you all. And and uh, let's let's uh, let's go to the Lord uh, together this morning. Father, as we come before you, we are so very blessed to be here. As we are, um, hopefully, with hearts and minds ready to to praise you. Uh, have a, uh, ready to receive what your word has to say to us. I mean, we know uh, what you call us to do and, and apply it in our daily lives. But Father, this morning as we, we gather together and, and worship together, uh, this is what pleases you, uh, unity and your people. And we all have the same thoughts. And every day, no matter what talents we have, abilities, uh, our goal is to, to bring glory to your name and, and further your kingdom. And I just pray, uh, not only for us individually, as we look for opportunities to serve and and just be kind to people and, and, and plant a seed of faith in someone's heart that they might know you as their Savior. But the church as a whole, corporately, Father, when we know the, the mission we have uh, to do our best to shine a light in this community, that people who do not know you might at least experience uh, your love uh, in, in a deed or, or a kind word. But, Father, I pray that you will bless the service, bless uh, our church as we move forward when we think of upcoming activities and events, uh, whether it's youth or Adults, uh, whatever outreach we plan to do, may, may we as a church be proactive that we know we have been so blessed as a people. And it is our responsibility, but also it is such a privilege to give back to others. So, Father, bless uh, our time together. We love you. We thank you for your son's death on the cross to know that there are so many things that happen in this world, so many uncertainties, but we have the assurance of eternal life in you. And that is a hope that this world can never take away from us, and we praise you for it. So it's these things that we lift up to your Son, and in Jesus' name we pray, and all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. You, you may be seated. Good morning, everyone. Again, we want to welcome our visitors uh, here to the New Vienna Church of Christ. And if you're back with us the second or third week, uh, good to have you back with us. But uh, so good to see you all, and, and uh, as we get ready to worship the Lord uh, together this morning. And hope everyone's had a great week. We all want to make a couple announcements. I know following Ken's... Uh, message. Uh, Francis will be uh, delivering the, the minutes from the board meeting and says he's uh, uh, we'll kind of let you know what happens there. Um, if you have signed up at all uh, for any clothes items for kids, uh, next Sunday is the due date for that. If you want to bring those in tonight, maybe not, but, but next Sunday is, is when those are due and we appreciate your help. Uh, you have no idea uh, when delivering those or I know last year, this year our goal is to have them come to the church, but you have no idea um, just the appreciation a parent has or a kid has, because, you know, if you look at our street, we have gifts. Uh, we are making an impact in some way in these, in these kids' lives, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be a part of a church that does that. The kids getting toys, and so it's a good thing, and, and it, it's good to see. But uh, we need to pray that maybe this kind deed motivates people to look to Christ. And we need to pray it. I know we hear it announced, but every day we should be praying that. Uh, that the spirit moves in people's hearts. People come to know Christ. Our country needs to know Christ. We need a revival in this country more than anything. We need people to look to God. But, uh, but, but be praying for that and, and be, be aware of those things. Uh, I know the bulletin uh, mentions uh, uh, some other announcements, upcoming things. Be aware of our Christmas Eve service, uh, the 24th, of course, which I don't know what other day it would be. Uh, but uh, it's on Monday evening at uh, 7 o'clock. We'll have a Christmas Eve service. And we had such a great attendance last year, uh, which was really good. But we uh, going to have a service together. We invite you, if you have family, to invite them as well to come and, and, and take part in that 7 o'clock uh, Christmas uh, Eve. Uh, not morning, night, just in case you're wondering. I didn't say 8 p.m. All right. So um, just trying to mix it up a little bit. I'll get on with it. We want, we want to make one announcement of uh, return over again. Uh, well, a couple of families want to keep in prayer. Uh, the Mingy family, uh, Stephanie Mingy, you've been on the prayer list. That is uh, the East Clinton's band director's wife. And at the age of 32, passed away with cancer. Uh, 32 years old. And uh, we want to remember that family in our prayers. And many of you may know this family uh, here, uh, I guess, uh, uh, here at the church. But uh, John and Shelley Williamson's daughter, Jody Gully, who's 40 years old, is in Christ Hospital with heart surgery and is not doing well. So uh, I know, I think some, some members know that family. Uh, but uh, we want to remember them uh, as well. And, and others on the prayer list, needs and concerns. We're very happy to hear that Kathy's still doing well, and they got back from our trip and had a good time in Tennessee. So that was good. And uh, Leroy continues to do well, so we're happy to hear that. So there is some praises going on, uh, too. So be mindful of those things and uh, uh, as we, uh, of course, remember uh, how blessed we are to have the health we have and be praying for others. So. 
Uh, and with that said, uh, Ian, uh, we'll turn it over to you with some announcements, and uh, we'll uh, get things started. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, any junior high students that are planning to go to Believe in February, I need your forms back next Sunday. Next Sunday is the deadline to get your forms in to me so I can get the payment to uh, CIY for that. It's, again, it's February 22nd and 23rd, so if you haven't got your forms and your junior high kids, see me, I still have some forms left. Uh, December 23rd, we'll be going Christmas caroling at 4 p.m., weather permitting. Um, I invite everybody who wants to go with us, especially the youth, um, leave here at 4. We'll be back at the church around 6, and everybody is invited back here at 6 o'clock. We'll have some chili and grilled cheese sandwiches and just have a time of fellowship and short devotion. So instead of the regular Sunday night service, um, everybody just meet back here at 6 o'clock and share with us and we'll have a time of fellowship for everything. But if you can go carrying with us, we'd love to have you out for Christmas carrying with us. That's all I've got. Francis, I'm going to turn it over to you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Just going to let you know about uh, the board meeting last Wednesday night. We spent a lot of money, had a good time. <laughs> <laughs> really, uh, Kendra can give us a report on the uh, Belief Conference to be held in, uh, on the campus of North Kentucky University. There are 13 youth eligible to go, and I'll be it will cost about $1,200 if we get it all paid before January. So that's probably what we'll do. Uh, board passed the motion to provide the money to send you to the police conference. We have three requests for scholarships Austin Palmer, Autumn Palmer, and Cody Pearl. All requests were granted. The motion was passed for the board to buy a new voting machine for the office. The other one would be not too old, it just don't work. And we got a new office. The new chairman would be Jerry Davis, Vice Chairman John Palmer, Secretary Francis Michael, Assistant Secretary Jesse Weaver, Treasurer Jerry Evans, Financial Secretary Don McKinney, Assistant Financial Secretary would be Brad Cooper, Dave Fitzgerald, and our Sunday School Superintendent would be Bruce Nancy Paul. Well, on another note, we have three members who are leaving the board for various reasons, health, family, and others. Uh, I'd like to have uh, Ladies and gentlemen, Stan Don Roberts. Can you stand, please? Is John Williams is not here. John's not here. Charles and Long. <laughs> I want you to recognize these gentlemen for the honor of
uh, spend time with the family, celebrate the birth of Christ, exchange gifts, exchange gifts. Just wonder this time, are you ever given a gift? And uh, wonder who that person got to. Maybe it was a girlfriend or a boyfriend or even a spouse. As he or she opened it, you, uh, you watch for a reaction and you might have even asked, Do you like this? In Philippians 4, verse 18, Paul said, I have received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Aphrodite the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. Gifts are given to these others. When the person is really spatial, you yearn to please them. I know God has a special place in your heart. I know you long to please him. Perhaps you wonder if the gift you bring today is pleasing to God. Be assured that it is. In the passage, Paul says their gift was pleasing to God. He also says it was fragrant. Can't you imagine someone taking a deep breath and saying, hmm, Keep this picture in your mind today as you give your gift and realize that it is pleasing to God. Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, thank you so much for the gifts that you bestowed out for us. Thank you for the much fruit made the rain that we got this week. And thank you for the gifts that you bestowed down on this church and this church family. Please accept these gifts we bring to you today and know it was given with love. God, we honor you, we love you, and we thank you. Bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. For our prayer here this morning, we'll be using hymn number 281. 281. First and third verse, be standing on the third verse.
shed blood there. What privilege it is to one that we can come together here around this table with one. Giving thanks. Thank you, Father, for the time this morning we can come together and worship together. We have a fellowship together this morning and shaking hands and hugging. What a blessing that is we can do that here in this church in New Vienna. He was glad this morning as he brings a message and someone will be touched by his, his words. Now as we take an examine this now with the loaf in the cup, the loaf represents his broken body. The cup through the vine represents his shed blood. Now as we partake, remember what that means. Bless his prayer in Jesus' precious name. Turn your hymn book to hymn number 487. That would be our hymn of invitation. 487. <coughs> we'll be using the first and third verses. Our closing will be number 27. What really is acceptable to our God? 
I think this is an honest question that all of us need to ask every one of ourselves individually and, and give an honest answer. What does God really accept from us as the way we worship and live for Him? Does the Lord accept our religion? Not just on Sunday morning, because that's a lot of times what we really focus on. But the way we live our life, is that acceptable to our God at this present moment? Can we say that we are doing all that we can to carry out the mission of Christ on this earth? That the people we come into contact with see God's love in us? That, that what we say and what we do is very evident to them, authentic Christianity? That what we're giving people isn't fake, it isn't phony, but is a genuine concern for them just as Christ had a genuine concern for people in need. Are we taking advantage of every opportunity we have to help someone in need? Many churches in their mindset worry about getting. And when they look at the resources they have, we need to worry about going out and using and sharing what is acceptable in the eyes of our Lord. Are we using every resource we have to full capacity for the glory of God? Or are we sitting on something? Are we holding back for some reason? Not just corporately as a church, but individually we have to all ask ourselves that question. Because I, I want to search, and your minister included this morning, we need to search our hearts as we read this verse and study together. Just two things. Because what may be acceptable to us is not acceptable to God. What we might be comfortable with is not what God is calling us to do on a daily basis. Concerning this verse in the book of James, John Calvin writes that he, the, the author James, does not define generally what religion is, uh, but reminds us that religion without things that he mentions is nothing. Now, we don't read this verse and think that's all God requires of us, but what James does give us is evidence of what is authentic. I want you to know a formula this morning, and it's just two points that we're looking at together. But I want you to know this. Pure actions plus a pure heart equals authentic Christianity. Can you say that with me? Pure actions plus a pure heart equals authentic Christianity. We're going to say that together. You're a little slow. We'll get into it this morning. So it's a pure Christianity. Wake me up when he's done. Because those two components together, you cannot have good deeds without a heart that's genuine. A heart that has a concern for people, and you can't have a pure heart but do nothing, you see. Authentic Christianity combines those two things, as James shows us. But prior to verse 27, as you read this chapter, in verses 22 and 25, James writes about how important it is to hear God's word. We would all agree that it is important, not just Sunday morning, but with a Wednesday night Bible study, but we want to hear what God's word says. You know, have to hear in order to have faith, as Romans tells us. But we would all agree that you can't do God's word without hearing it. Now, James makes a mention of the fact that, that we just don't hear what is said, but we do it. We apply it daily. We work on making God's principles a priority in our lives and living them out for people to see. But James is concerned with the overemphasis on the hearing to the neglect of the doing. Many Christians today are fine with doing just enough. Many Christians today are, are, are fine with just attending church once a week. They're fine when the offering plates pass by and, and they, they put a tithe in. They're very comfortable with what they do. They're fine with doing just enough. But understand, when we think of what God has done for us and the responsibility we have to be a light to a lost and dying world, just enough in our eyes is not good enough to our Lord who has done so much for us. But think of the church as a whole. Many churches today are, are fine with doing just enough. We pay the bills to keep the church open. We give a good percentage of what we make to missions, and that's what we're called to do. We want to support those uh, globally who preach the gospel message, and, and we do our part. And, and when, when the church asks us to do something, tithing regularly, once a week, we, we do what we're called to do. But many churches are fine doing just enough. We listen to the word. We know what we need to do to get by, and we think it's acceptable to God, but we're perfectly content to remain the same. We're never moved to do more when God has done so much for us. And I don't know why, because Ephesians 3 tells us that, that it is God's power at work in us. 
So when we use what God has given us, when we make ourselves available and say, you know, put me here, plug me in, or I'm going to help my coworker. I'm going to do something for them and they don't know it. Or I'm going to do a random act of kindness or a good deed or be polite or invite someone to church. It is not just what we do. It is God working through us. And that should motivate us to know that we are fully capable of doing more than we could ever imagine, as Paul writes in Ephesians, by God working in us, not ourselves. We've got to look up and rely on God as a church and as a people that he will do great things through us when we let him. Now, earlier in this chapter, James 1, look at the verse 17 and notice what, what James writes. He says the following, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change his shifting shadow. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Every blessing that this church has received, every good thing that's happened in our lives individually, it is the result of one thing, God Almighty, who has given us a blessing, has, has provided that we may be prosperous and take care of family and be in a position to, to, to have our needs met. It is by the power of God. Oh, how blessed we are as his people. How blessed this church is, amen? amen. We're saved by grace. And if that can't put a smile on, on, on our faces that people see, there's a problem. Because that's the most important thing in our lives is to know what Jesus has done for us at the cross of Calvary. We should not be so hesitant uh, to give to others what God has so generously given to us. We should not give second thought when we see a need to meet it, not with what we think is ours. It is what God has given us as a church and as a people individually. How dare we be hesitant with what he's given us? Helping people <coughs> meet genuine, real needs was a key component to the evangelism of Jesus Christ on this earth. We looked at it last week. When he blessed the poor, the oppressed, the, the, the blind, the lame, people who are in need. God was engaged. Christ saw that need. He showed God's love, and it always opened the door that they might come to know God personally in their life as a heavenly father and as a child. It's a key component. Meeting needs. The church must be pro active. We have to be on the offensive, ladies and gentlemen, concerning how we meet the needs of a lost and dying world that they might know Jesus Christ. <clears throat> because just keeping the doors open isn't going to cut it. Attending church and knowing, hey, I invited you to church and you weren't there, well, that's your loss about God's grace. They know what time our church is open, they should be here. It's much more than that. When we think of the resources this church has, what God has done, we need to be proactive and knowing not just this next step and just planning it, but five steps ahead to say, this may not work, let's try something else, because I want you to know the risk is worth the reward. That one person might know who Jesus Christ is. Amen. What good is resources God gives us if we sit on it? What good individual in our lives if we don't invite our co-worker to church? That there's a family that needs, some kids need help, but we buy a coat, pants. You think that's not a big deal. It isn't that family that they see God's love and it impacts their lives. Generosity, kindness, what is acceptable in the eyes of God. How can we be content doing just enough as God's people when there are so many people in? Pure actions plus a pure heart equals authentic Christianity. There's two things this morning I want us to touch on that I believe should motivate us and give us an urgency to know there's so much more we can be doing from this verse. And, and the first part is this, pure actions. That's the first part of our equation this morning. I want you to say it with me. Pure actions, pure actions. plus a pure heart, plus a pure heart. Equals, authentic Christianity. equals authentic Christianity. A little better. Right. <laughs> first part is this, pure actions. Notice the first part of that verse because he says, he, he, James says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, the first part. To look after orphans and widows in their distress. Pure actions. Listening does us no good if we do not do what we're told. I listen a lot to what my wife says. I don't do it all the time. And the result is not good. Listening 
does us no good if we don't do what we're told. Now, sometimes people may tell us not to do something good, not to do it, but we have to use common sense. But when it comes to God's Word, we hear a sermon preached, a lesson taught every week, and we can listen and, and have ears open. But if we're not ready to say, you know what, how can I use this verse that God is telling me to impact my life? It does us no good if there's no doing, you see. Good listening leads to good doing. If we know what God's Word says and our hearts are open to it, then we can't help but not apply it in our lives because we know what it means to us and what an impact it can be to others. If we have the good news of the gospel message of Jesus Christ and know that we're saved by grace, how can we not tell others about it? How can we not show others the love that God has shown us in our own individual lives? So we find two evidences of acceptable religion in this verse. The first is pure actions, a, a, a social concern. For people in need. At 1 John 3, verse 18 says, Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. Proactive, you see. John writes in his first epistle that if there is need to be met, we are proactive. That we're looking to help. We're not waiting for people to come here. We're going out to the people because there is a need that people know who Jesus is. God's love cannot possibly be in us. If we're ignoring those in me. It says in 1 John 3. We love in action. And truth. Because God never ignores those in me. You may be here this morning. And there's a need that needs to be met in your life. And, and maybe it is physically. Or, or when you think of family. Or relationships. Or problems that need to be met. Or personal you know, unspoken requests. But you just think spiritually. You may be here. And you don't know Jesus as your Savior. God is not ignoring you. You may think, I'm on this earth and things are bad. What do I do? God is right there. He does not ignore the need you have. As a matter of fact, God's care for orphans and widows is commanded in the Old Testament as a way of imitating God's own concern for them. If we are God's children, then we imitate who God, who God is. So if God is love, what are we to be? Love. If God is mercy, what are we to be? Merciful, forgiving, humble. The list goes on and on. That we imitate our Father so that people can see God in action, His love, on this earth. The person you come into contact with in a random act of kindness or you give a gift to or a good deed or talk to, that might be the only Christ they see that day, that week, their life. What seed are you planting? What impact are you making in their life? Do they know you care? Psalm 68 verse 5 says, A father to the fatherless... A defender of widows is God in his holy dwelling. An orphan and a widow. Two people who are in need. And we're not just focusing on orphans today and widows. And, but it gives us the idea that these are people who, when we look at, probably face distress. Heartache. Difficulty. But we encapsulate that with everyone when we think of those in distress and in need. Christians whose religion is pure and faultless, as James says, in the eyes of God, will imitate their father by intervening to help those in need. No questions asked. And I know the, the thought that we have in our mind is, but if we do this and we spend this money, what if it doesn't work? It's not your money to spend. To get that through your heads this morning. It's God's. Sometimes we take that risk and we come up short, but we know why we did it. Because God, Christ calls us to. Pure religion will lead to a life of practical benevolence. God has always revealed himself as a friend to the friendless. As someone who loves the unlovable. Cares for those the world doesn't care for. I want you to hold your place and turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 10. Deuteronomy, chapter 10. Verses 17 through 19. Deuteronomy 10, verses 17 to 19, as the law is being established, Moses is going over with the people, things they're called to do, and, and, and I love the first part of the book of Deuteronomy, because when, when God says, Moses, I want you to tell the people, make sure that the law is read, my word is read, and bring the whole family. Generation was important. Family was an important unit uh, to, to, to God that the word of God might be taught. Family is the first classroom when we think of Christian learning. And teaching people the word of God that, that children see uh, 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 their parents live that out uh, when God's word is, is heard or, or taught. In ver or verse 17, chapter 10, notice he says, For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords. 
the great God, mighty and awesome, and shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. So people that think they can buy their salvation, God's not bribed. He accepts no partiality. There are many people today that look and come to church and they think, I'm out of place. I, I, I don't have the nicest clothes. I, I'm dealing with something in my life that nobody would even think of, of dealing with. If they found out, they'd think of me as an outcast. God says, there is no partiality with me. I'm reminded of the prodigal son. And no matter the sinner that you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what is happening, God has his arms wide open. He shuts his arms to no one when they come to him. And guys, if we're believers, children of God, and church as a whole, how can we shut our arms to people? So he says there's no partiality. Verse 18, he defends the cause of the fatherless. There are so many children in me. I'm proud of what this church does. I'm happy that 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 our kids went Christmas shopping for kids' gifts. I, I, I'm proud that the list went around and, and you guys signed up to get a pair of pants or pajama bottoms for, for a kid. Because there's a lot of kids that don't have a mom and dad. Now, they may be present in the home, but that's about it. There's kids in need. If the church expects to grow, the kids are the future. He's a, a father to the fatherless. Notice, uh, and the widow. He loves the alien, giving him food and clothing. And you are to love those who are aliens, for you yourselves were aliens in Egypt. He says, guys, listen, Israelites, you know what it was to be an outcast. You were an Egyptian bondage for years. You were an outcast. You were a social pariah. No one wanted anything to do with you. And I sent Moses to deliver you. You know what it is to be delivered and loved. You better love others the same. For a revolving door. Pure religion will lead to a life of practical benevolence. <laughs> Understand that God intended his people to display benevolence, not just corporately, but also personally. As God's people, we are called to give a tithe on the first day of the week. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2. The early church met on the first day of the week. They took up the collection and they sent it to the church in Jerusalem. The idea was, well, they used those uh, monies uh, to help needy or help poor or, or you know, things uh, that need to be taken care of. They gave back to God. Tithing is an Old Testament principle. We would not say that we tithe of the Old Testament because we don't get a tenth of everything we got. But we do look at a tenth of our finances and we say, let's give back to God with our whole heart. Some give more. Uh, praise you for that. But, but we understand the principle of giving. But it's not just enough for us as individual believers to attend the church weekly, we write a check, we put cash in the offering, and then we think, all right, the church will do something with this. I'm giving the church my money so that they can take care of how I'm supposed to be benevolent. I give to the church, people say. Because I, I want you to know you can't pay someone else to live a life of benevolence for you. Well, the elders will spend it. I gave money that week. I mean, they'll do something good with it, so... I crossed it off my list. No, it's more than just giving money, but how you live your life individually. Can people see kindness and mercy in you? Can the love of God be seen? It is acts of kindness and generosity that Jesus used to personally connect with people. He was engaged in people's lives. And benevolence engages us in the lives of people. Showing the actual care. <coughs> Those who suffer from want in the third world, inner city, New Vienna. The unemployment rate of Clinton County the last time I checked was 16%. I don't know if that's gotten any better, but that is poor. The counties you live in respectively are the same. There's a lot of people in need in this community alone. This church has been here for 150 years. The people that live here now, they don't know anything about anything. Times have changed for people that live here. What are we doing right now to reach this community and let them know this is a light of hope that, that, that shines Christ on? Think of those who are unemployed and have no money, who are hoping for work, that really genuinely need to put some food on the table for their kids and they don't know where that next paycheck's going to come. Those who are inadequately represented in government or law, the oppressed, uh, taken advantage of. And I, again, let me be clear, I want to help the helpless, not the clueless, all right? But those children who are abused, neglected, 
unloved. If you haven't attended one service during VBS, I want you to look at the eyes of those kids. And yeah, they may be ornery and loud, but a lot of them go to a home where there's no love. A lot of them go home to a parent who's abusive or doesn't care. They don't have clothes to put on. You look at them, you go to school, and you see a kid that's 20 degrees, they don't have a winter coat. They wear the same outfit three days in a row. There's children in need. There are those who are alone, without family. We think of those who are widowed. And the church family is that, that, that comfort, that care. We need to embrace those who feel alone and know they're right. Because it's these people, folks, that ought to see an abundant evidence of pure actions from the way we live. And notice how I said abundant, not just enough. Your actions. That leads us to the second part of our equation. Pure actions plus a pure heart equals authentic Christianity. But if we're going to have pure actions, and we know it's important to understand that without a pure heart, it doesn't mean a lot what we do. God can still use it, but God wants the heart of an individual. Notice the next part of James chapter 1, verse 27. What is pure? Faultless to help the distressed, widows, orphans. The second thing is to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. This is, in essence, moral purity. How we live our life outside the doors. How we live day to day. It's easy to look Christian here. Not so much out there. What makes New Vienna Church of Christ different from many other churches in this community and the other churches of Christ? There's a lot of churches people go to. What do they say to hypocrites? Right? You don't live what you, you practice to so-called follow. And a lot of times they're right. That what really matters is what happens when we leave the doors and we go out to the real world where people need Christ and they see that in us. I've mentioned this song before in my sermons, but Casting Crowns uh, sings the song, Jesus, Friend of Sinners. And, and the most important verse to me is, is you know, the main part of the song, Jesus, Friend of Sinners, break our heart for what breaks yours. Think of that for a second. Because that's a risk to many people. Because if we asked you pray when we got up in the morning, Father, break our heart for what breaks yours, make sure I, I have an opportunity, I'm telling you guys, I'll hit you in the face with it. That we're really praying, Father, break Break my heart for what breaks. Do you know what broke Jesus' heart? As he stood above Jerusalem and he saw all the people, some who had believed him, many who had not, he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would have given you all. I would have done so much for you. I would have collected you as a hen gathers her chicks under her wing, but you would not. If we have a heart that Christ has, then we're going to break for those in need. And know that's an opportunity to tell them about God's love, at least it should Our actions, our benevolence, good deeds mean nothing if our heart isn't it. There's a lot of you here who do a lot of good things, and no one knows about it. Under the table very quietly, and if you're doing good deeds, to keep it up. I I'm not here to, to just be so judgmental this morning. But know that if your heart is not in what you do, whether you're an elder, a deacon, a minister, a secretary, a, a Sunday school teacher, whatever you do as a member of the congregation, a member of Sunday school, if our heart isn't in what we're doing, why are we doing it? All of us. <clears throat> Jesus' heart was devoted to the will of the Father. So much so that he knew the moment he was born of a virgin birth, what would come. And he performed his ministry step by step knowing that, that the cross was coming. And he didn't set his glare aside. He fixed himself straight at Calvary and knew he would die for the sins of the world. Innocently. But what a heart Jesus had for the world. His heart hurt for lost people. And if Jesus' mission is our mission, then we better have the heart that Jesus had for people. An acceptable religion to God includes a pure heart. To keep oneself from being polluted by the world means to avoid thinking like the world. Thinking in accordance with the value systems of this world. We live in a very selfish world, a very entitled world. There are many people who feel that they're entitled to a job, they're entitled to have a paycheck and not do anything for it. Many people with their hand out expect more, and when you put it in their hand, they have the other hand 
down and say you didn't fill this one. And it's getting worse. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of needs to be met. But the value system in this world says, I'm going to get what I get out of it. And I'm not going to worry about anybody else. And here's the sad part. Many Christians are the same thing today. Now, we may not initially say we're selfish people. But we don't want something else happening in the church because this is the way we've had it for years. And this is the way we want it. No matter who's affected by it, no matter what we do. Because we're comfortable with the way things are. Sadly, many Christians are sick that way. We can't be that way. This society, by and large, the practices and the beliefs that it has, uh, unchristian, if not anti Christian, and, and how people view well, the, the, the church. But we keep ourselves from being polluted by the world because we don't want to act like the world. If we are going to affect people with the light of Jesus Christ, then how can we keep that light hidden? We have to be authentic, moral purity. Romans 12 tells us that we're to be living sacrifices, acceptable, pleasing to God. And verse 2 says, do not be conformed to the ways of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The transformation that takes place in our lives is inside out. The moment Christ enters our lives, we're transformed into the same that Christ calls us to. But when the heart is transformed, then it is going to be evident in our actions who we are as a people. That if we are serious about making Jesus Christ first in our lives, then people will not be able to not see God's love. That they cannot help but see the different way we live. At least that should be. If your co-workers and your family and your friends cannot see God in you, we need to honestly ask ourselves, is what we're doing acceptable to the Lord? Is how we live acceptable to our Father? Do not be conformed to the ways of this world. Our heart will genuinely break for those in need if we truly take the mission of Jesus seriously. Not being selfish, but being selfless. And that's what our Savior did. Hold your place with me and turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 10 through 17. Uh, the book of Isaiah has 66 books. It's been called the mini Bible of the Bible. Uh, so much that Isaiah writes. And we know many prophecies given about not just the virgin birth, but about what would take place at the cross and the resurrection. And, and uh, so much uh, that the prophet Isaiah had to say. And, and the very first chapter and throughout, it's a call for the people of Israel to repent. I want you to know this this morning. God detests heartless religion. God hates it. Because you're not supposed to say you hate anything. God hates heartless Christianity. God hates what is just show. God hates what is just emotions every Sunday. The routine. God hates it. The Israelites were God's chosen people. And we know they were chosen. That would be the lineage through which Christ would come. They were the nation of Israel, God's people, naturally, so Christ would come. We know that we're not saved by nationality today, but whether you are Jew or a Gentile, you're saved by the grace of God when we accept individually Jesus Christ as our Savior. But Isaiah 1, verse 10, notice what God says to the Israelites. He says, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Now, just to kind of clarify that's a throwdown. Sodom and Gomorrah, not a good place. All right? So not only was our God very bold in what he said, but I think he'd be a little snippy too. I like it. Yeah, it's point across. You rulers of Sodom, you, you leaders of Gomorrah, notice what he says. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me? Says the Lord, I have more than enough burnt offerings. Of rams and of fat and fatted animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? God is saying, you offer sacrifice after sacrifice. It's the purest of animals. I don't care. I own the world. Last time you checked. I'm sovereign. All of that's mine. You can offer perfect sacrifice after perfect sacrifice. Uh, the, the best of offerings. And, 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 and go through the rituals of what the law says. But you people, your heart is far from me. I don't care what you do. How you worship. I have no 
no pleasure, God says in these things. Verse 13, he says, stop bringing meaningless offerings. What we do from Sunday morning to Sunday morning, what we do day to day, ask yourself, is this really any meaning to God? Or is it meaningless what I'm doing? Honestly, ask yourself that. Myself included. God says, yeah, you honor these festivals and feasts. Notice he says, your incense is detestable to me. Many synagogue services, there's always an incense that's all about uh, You have spices of some kind, and it's a, a, a nice aroma, but God says, I hold my nose to it. It, 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 I detest it, God says. New moons and Sabbaths and convocations, I cannot bear your evil assemblies. Your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong and learn to do right. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. God says, I have made you my people, and you, in turn, are not doing what I've called you to do. If I make you my people, then I want you to represent me the best you can. And you, quite frankly, all you're worried about is how it looks in a synagogue service. And no one can see the love that I have for man in you. That's what he's telling them. That's the Brad Klaus version. You can look it up. He says, you offer your offerings, and you pray so many times, and your prayers are eloquent, and we gather together as a church, and we pray together, and we listen to a prayer list of needs and concerns, we hear about, about what's going on in the community, and yeah, we find, and we pray together, and we hear a sermon, and we go about it, and that's it. We give two hours, unless the minister's long winded and goes a little lower, and after that, we're not asked to do anything else. God says, you can claim to be my people all you want to, but stop doing wrong and do what is right. Fix your hearts. Repent and get right when you need to. Put me as first priority and start doing good. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the cause of fatherless. God says, I'm not recognizing your worship. Understand this church can be open for 100, another 150 years. They can be open right now. And, and we look at, at, at what we have in the month, our, our bank account. And we look at how blessed we've been. Some of you were not here for our congregational meeting or when this was announced when it was made. I didn't know Betty Schaefer very well as a person. Uh, and I say that because I came on a little later in, in the ministry. Passed away, you would have never known she had any money. She left the church almost uh, $150,000. $134,000 to be exact. We're blessed. We are blessed as a church. Amen. But I, I feel like a lot of us are uncomfortable from sitting on that so much. We squirm a little bit because we're not being proactive in what God has given us to know that we are blessed and God says in turn, you go out and use it. Be proactive. It is hypocritical for God's people to do, to do good with a heart that isn't pure. It's hypocritical to go through the motions when your heart is somewhere else. God just assume you're not doing it at all. Because having the heart of Christ means that we will live a Christ-like life. And living a Christ-like life means that we are going to have the heart of Christ. And that means we are going to be moved to make sure that the people we come into contact with know who God is and experience His love first. Because without moral purity, without a social concern for others, it is merely shown. It's not enough just to show Christianity. It has to be authentic so people can see it and know it. You see, pure actions plus a pure heart equals authentic Christianity. There are so many opportunities. And this time of year especially, there's people in need. There's genuine need. But there's so many opportunities of outreach. There's opportunities that let's try this and see. We can't be afraid of what the results can be. We can't be afraid that if I take a chance on my coworker, I'm going to spend this money and this gift, and they may not even recognize it. I don't like that. I want them to say thank you. 
That's not why you serve. That maybe that coworker sees you can. That opens the door to say, hey, I appreciate that gift. And you invite the church the next Sunday. That, that leads, as Jesus' vision was, the physical to the spiritual. Many churches are sitting on a vast amount of resources that God has given them. Because they're afraid of the risk. That they're, they're happy just collecting interest. That will do something with it. At some point, we're going to need a massive emergency. And we're going to have to use all this money. When there's so many people in need around us right now that can use it at this very moment in outreach and reaching out and helping and meeting the needs of people. Pure actions plus a pure heart equals authentic Christianity. Say it with me. Pure actions plus a pure heart equals authentic Christianity. Are you authentic? <clears throat> Is this church authentic? Is what we're doing right now acceptable? Are we okay with saying we're doing just enough and we're all right? I don't think that's all right to our God. What is pure and faultless is doing our very best to meet people's needs so that they might come into contact and know Jesus Christ as their Savior. That's acceptable religion to our God. What's pure and faultless is when we live a life of Christ and we have a heart that Christ had to do. So ask yourselves this morning, and what I do, is what I do right now, is it acceptable to the Lord? I hope you can answer that honestly. Let's pray. Father, I pray this morning that as we, we see this one verse as James writes this, and, and it's very clear what you deem to be acceptable worship, to be acceptable religion, what is pure and faultless is addressing the needs of man, being proactive and showing people that you love them, that we care about them. Not as a church of New Vienna Church of Christ, this church as a whole, but all of us individually. That we are doing our best to, to be engaged in people's lives and to share with them love. Whether it's a kind word or a good deed. That knowing that that seed is planted and somehow maybe that one event that they, they experience. If someone cares about them, that opens the door to know, let me tell you who really cares about them. Father, I pray that this church is about being proactive. There's a lot of risk in some of the things that we may do. But we need to know that the reward is saving a soul. What's a greater risk is many who do not know you and their soul's in danger. <clears throat> what are we doing to show them your love? And individually in our lives, Father, we ask ourselves the question, what really is acceptable to you and are we doing it in our lives? Is our heart pure? Is our heart in it? And if we are genuinely serious about saying, we want to, to adopt your mission, we want to do what you have done on this earth, Father, and then follow you, then we're going to have the heart that you have for people. Because we cannot present to you good gifts and good deeds with a heart that's impure. Father, may what people see in this church, in our own lives, be genuine and authentic. Pure actions and a pure heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The new year approaches. And the uh, new year has many opportunities. Now, I know Ken and Stephanie working with youth are trying some new things. And I've talked with several people and we want to try some new things. And there's things that that, that that's we not have done before outreach wise. But we're gonna do it. And we're gonna do our best. And then what if it fails? What if it does? I'd rather fail at doing something than doing absolutely nothing. I'd rather risk and, and it fall short than be complete content in doing just enough and being lazy and do nothing. We need to be proactive. 
and people individually in our lives, knowing what Christ calls us to do. And this church needs to be proactive in how we can impact the most people with the love of Jesus Christ. That's our mission. That's a responsibility. That's what is acceptable to our Father. We're going to have him an invitation this morning. The challenge is laid out pretty clearly to us for God's people. But we offer a time of invitation because there might be someone here who does not know Jesus as their Lord. And, and you think of the category of those who are in distress or feel like they're alone or neglected or you have problems. God loves you so much. God cares for you. And he is just waiting with arms wide open to embrace you so that you can experience not just his grace, but his power at work in you. You have no idea what you're capable of until you give your life to Jesus Christ this morning. That's my prayer. May the Spirit move in your heart that you might know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Whatever decision you need to make this morning, whether it's rededicating your life and getting things in order, whether it's wanting to, to learn uh, uh, just how to, what can we do to, to get it plugged in and, and be an impact. Because here's the thing, I can invite you to say, oh, if you want to serve, get plugged in and serve. You know what people say, where can I serve? What area can I give when I have this talent and we don't have that area to offer? That's why we have to be proactive and making sure we're utilizing all of our resources and knowing what people are talented at and capable of doing and utilizing it so that the kingdom of God can grow. Whatever needs you have, will you please stand as we sing our hymn of the as well?
kind of fellowship following that. Not a regular service, but 6 o'clock on the 23rd we'll meet and uh, have a nice uh, chili, some grilled cheese fellowship, and have a kind of mini devotion. I promise it won't be long. And uh, just uh, a little different for that. Christmas Eve service, 7 o'clock. We also hope to see you there uh, on the 24th. And, and please, if you have family, bring them. But uh, this is a nice time to gather together on the eve of our Savior's birth. What a special time of year this is. And then make sure when you see people, tell them Merry Christmas. All right? Listen, you can say Happy Holidays, but don't say Merry, you know, without Merry Christmas. Uh, not Merry Winter Solstice, anything like that. It's Merry Christmas. All right? Christmas. All right? Uh, be worthy of other announcements we made. If there is nothing else, um, one thirty-one. Absolutely. So you want to? Uh, that's pretty good. So we're, we're very happy to see that up there. That's where we should be every Sunday. But uh, thank you for being a part of that. That's where we're up there. Uh, with that being said, we'll close with prayer, and uh, we'll, we'll say our closing song and, and be dismissed once again. Father, thank you. Uh, thank you for your love. Thank you for sending your Son to take our place on the cross to give us the hope of eternal life. Thank you for loving us and taking a chance on us to know that that we are. Uh, capable of so much if we would just give our lives to you. May you work in our lives, this church as a whole and individually, that we have a heart that you had for people. And that in our actions, in our heart, that, that we show people what authentic Christianity is. What is acceptable in your sight. So bless us as we leave here this morning and keep us safe as we, we gather back tonight and, and be with us through the week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.